Who here does continuous integration? Great, that's awesome. That's not what this talk is about. <laughs> um, we're actually gonna be talking, the CI here we're gonna be talking about is continuous improvement, right? So retrospectives, postmortems, words that you would hear and concepts that um, would make you better at continuous improvement. Um, that said, it's funny, I've had this talk, it's like the, uh, this didn't happen here, but I've had this talk accepted into the CICD track at conferences, and it's like, did you even read the CFP that I, that I sent you? Um, so if you were thinking, hey, they're gonna be, we're gonna be, Paul's gonna be talking about, what? Back there? All right, so if you think, um, you think, oh, this is not a talk for me because we're doing continuous uh, integration, and I thought this was gonna be out about continuous integration, uh, one of the things to remember is that CI and CD are both a form of continuous improvement, right? So a lot of the things that you might experience while you're building your CI pipeline or CD pipeline, um, maybe if some of you have had incidents related to your deployment pipeline, uh, this is stuff that's going to be relevant to your life. So this is the obligatory about me slide. I'm not going to go through it except to say two things. My Twitter name is up top. So if I say something that you have a question about, you can tweet me in the tweeter sphere. Um, and the last thing I want to point out is the last bullet point. Um, I just finished up my Master's of Science in Human Factors and System Safety. And the reason that I mention that is a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about this morning have to do with human factors and system safety and the, the safety sciences, the research that's been done there over the past 80 years or so. All right, let's launch into it. Dirty word number one, root cause analysis. Who does root cause analysis? Yeah, OK. Um, this is me whenever I hear that word. Uh, so, uh, I, I, so by the way, I stole most of the, the definitions from Wikipedia because, you know, everybody does that. Crib their homework a little bit. But root cause analysis, a method of problem solving used for identifying the root causes of faults or problems. And of course, the factor is considered root cause if removal of that particular thing that we identify prevents the final sort of issue or incident from recurring. So this is our perception, right? And, and the, it's this idea that uh, it, in, a, in a particular incident, there's a series of dominoes, and each domino hit the next domino. And, and uh, so the way that we need to solve this problem is remove one of the dominoes, or maybe we need to get a bigger domino so the, the dominoes just stop at that point, right? But ultimately, it's, it's a, a linear model of thinking about the world. And in fact, it is deceptively linear. A lot of times when we go back to that deployment pipeline example, we think, oh, you know, somebody might have checked in some code. Maybe we had some unit tests that weren't working quite right, so they let some code through that shouldn't have gone through. And then it got out to deployment, and that caused the incident, right? So that's our thinking about the model. But this is really the reality that we work in. So what's interesting about this is uh, it stopped there, right? So you might say, well, that's the incident, right? And they actually had to restart it again. Somebody throws a marble uh, later in the video and then starts the rest of it. Um, but there's a couple of interesting things here. Most of the time when we're doing root cause analysis, we might look at just the last few spots of this, this system before, before it broke, right? We don't ever get back to all of the different ways and paths that something can take. And it worked. And it worked, and we, we didn't notice that. The other thing I wanted to ask, uh, ask you all, did you notice that parts of this system didn't work, and yet it kept going without anybody really noticing? Well, there's a kid in there that goes, aw, every time something breaks. So you kind of know it from that. But. So um, I, always like to say, I always like to say this, because I work with a lot of clients, and, and they're like, we found the root cause. Here's eight of them. If you have more than one root, if you have multiple root causes, you do not have a root cause. Um, it's interesting, uh, there was an aviation accident um, in Canada, and 
the government said, we want you to find the root cause. And the person who did the investigation actually said they refused to do that. And they came up with 191 root causes. And they spanned everything from maintenance to air traffic control in Canada to uh, Canada's version of the FAA, which is probably why they may not have wanted him to tell what those 191 causes were. So what's a better choice here? Uh, oh, sorry. One of the main problems with root causes, causes, and this is a great quote from Dr. Decker, who was presented last year here, uh, cause is something you construct. So what you call root cause is simply the place where you stop looking any further. That's the point in the system that we all sort of agree. We don't need to, we don't need to keep going. We can call that the root cause. And that's the important point here, is it's a socially constructed idea. Sometimes we call it the stopping rule, right? Each organization has a stopping rule for how far they'll go into an investigation. So what's a better choice for, for root cause analysis? Proximate causes. There's always multiple causes to a particular uh, event or incident. But you need to be very careful uh, when thinking about this because, um, so don't forget the limitations. Even if you have proximate causes, it's still uh, a linear model. And I think one of the issues with this, and this is really uh, the critical point here, is that we get ourselves into trouble when we say we fix the root cause. And then two weeks later, the same incident or a very similar incident happens. And then you get asked by your boss, I thought you found and fixed the root cause. And that's, a, that's a bad conversation to be having. But that's the problem with that way of thinking about the world. Because the world may not actually work like that. It doesn't work like that. So just because you fix the root cause doesn't necessarily mean you're going to prevent the incident. All right, dirty word number two, the five whys. Who does, who does five whys? Yeah, okay, so uh, iterative interrogative technique used to explore cause and effect relationships underlying a particular problem. And you do this by repeating the question why. Um, I always feel when I watch people do five whys like this. Hello. Oh. Hello. Oh. Hello. I want a cracker. What? I want a cracker. You want a cracker? Huh? What do you say? I want a cracker. What? I want a cracker. Okay. So the funny thing about this is uh, I don't have kids, but also I was chatting with someone who does, and they were like, oh, you know, like talking to a five-year-old. You know, why is the sky blue? Well, because of rain and clouds and things. Well, why are there clouds up there? Well, because water, right? You know, it can go on forever. Um, the perception here is that incidents are deterministic um, so that we get the same inputs. We would get the same outputs every single time. Um, and what it, the reason I make this point is I found uh, there seems to be this weird sort of dichotomy. Developers really seem to like, if you have a development background, seem to like the five whys. They seem to like that as a mental model of, of thinking about the problem space. And I've always sort of wondered that because um, if, you, if you look at their, the operations people sometimes will go, oh, yeah, kind of five whys doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think the distinction is, is that developers are used to writing code and so if there's a bug or an issue, as long as you change the, out, the input, you'll get the different output and you'll be able to fix the output. So it's linear and it's deterministic. That's the important part, it's deterministic. What's interesting though is, of course, seasoned developers know that that's not even true. Um, anyone remember Joel Spolsky, uh, Joel on software? He has a really interesting story about uh, this bit of code. And, and the point here is that they were getting crash reports in the field from this line of code. Uh, the blah line was blowing up. And if you know anything about C++, it is in the standard that R can't be null. It's in the standard. It should never happen. And yet, once you have a big enough population size, they were having millions of people run their code. It's like if you had a bad, you know, kind of crappy Packard Bell computer, you might actually crash. R could be null. And they, there's no way to solve this problem. Like, you can't fix it because it's in the spec. It should never happen, right? So even uh, de seasoned developers know, like, software isn't entirely deterministic. Now, for operations people, because they deal in infrastructure, I think there's an intrinsic understanding that that determinism sort of is not a thing, right? Uh, Mark Burgess uh, has a great book called In Search of Certainty, where he talks about large-scale internet systems that we operate have more in um, common with quantum physics than they do with traditional physics. And he makes that argument. He's a physicist. Um, and if that name is familiar, he invented CF Engine, which is where Chef and Puppet come from. Um, so he's been thinking about this problem for a really long time. 
So um, the, what the argument that I would make is that five whys is in a, an inappropriate tool for addressing operational incidents. And since most of the incidents that we're thinking about are software running on top of operations in some way, it's just not a useful model. One of the things I'll, I, I don't know, this photo is so funny to me. If you look really closely, you will see salt and a box of tissues on the table. <laughs> And I don't know if that's like a luck thing or people crying in the room whenever they have to run a patch cable. I don't know what's going on there. So, a uh, better choice for five whys? Just no, stop doing it. Um, there's a couple of other models that are more useful, the Swiss cheese model, the systemic model. Um, but ultimately, five whys still uh, is part of that linear thinking that, again, is not the world we live in. Okay, dirty word number three. Human error. All right. Who has had a retro from an incident where the problem classification was human error? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, most, pretty much everybody in the room. All right. So human error has been cited as a primary cause or contributing factor in disasters and accidents. Um, prevention of human error is generally seen as a major contributor to reliability and safety of complex systems, which is interesting. But I have a question for you. I mean, that's a very nice formal definition, and I'm sure you know somebody put a lot of time into writing it. But really, what is human error? Now, this is uh, uh, James Reason's conception of human error, and it's it's interesting. Um, this is probably from the 70s, and he was trying to figure out, okay, well, was the action intentional or unintentional? And then uh, if it was intentional, you might think of it differently than if it was unintentional. And basically, he came up with these things where it's like, okay, you've got a slip or a lapse or a mistake. And then his argument was, well, if you could classify them, then you might treat them differently. Um, but the real problem with that is, who gets to draw that line? Who gets to make that determination that it was a slip? versus a lapse, right? It really actually sort of requires us to understand what was going on in the human that supposedly erred before we can make that determination, and that's not a thing that we can do. We can't experience other people's reality in any way that provides us that fidelity. So it's, it's interesting, this idea of where, where you draw the line, it applies in a couple ways. It's what constitutes human error, right? And also, it's where do you de uh, decide to stop pursuing what you do about it, right? Were they tired, were they not trained, right? Human error stops all of those other avenues of exploration about how to improve the system because we just blamed it on that individual person. It often also ignores things like, you know, what other incentives or interests uh, are in the system um, and, wh and what are the incentives around drawing that line where it is. Um, and so it's a real problem. Um, it's interesting, people have taken James Reason's work and they've applied penalty models to was it a slip or a lapse or a mistake. And that's a huge problem because in those penalty models, people lose their jobs, people go to jail. And this has happened in healthcare, this is not hypothetical. Um, with self-driving cars and maybe sometimes self-driving cars killing people, which has also happened, this is now a problem in technology and software. So another great quote from Dr. Decker, human error is the cause of, uh, not the cause of failure, but the effect. So human error can never be the conclusion of your investigation. It is, in fact, uh, the starting point. And it uh, dovetails nicely with, the, with this idea of root cause. I love it when somebody tells me, oh, we found the root cause was human error. And I'm like, okay, there's a lot, lot going on there. Let's parse all of that apart. Um, but here's the point, right? Um, human error is often a, a prelude to constraining our learning, right? Because oftentimes we'll say, oh, maybe we need to put that person on a, a PIP, a performance improvement plan, or maybe we need to get them better training. Um, did people remember the Oscars flub a couple years ago where they read the best picture and it wasn't the right, you know, wasn't the right thing, wasn't the right movie? Um, and of course, these people got fired um, from the, the accounting company, I think it was PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, they got fired. And it's interesting, right, though, if you start to um, dig into this, um, a researcher who works, uh, I think, in air traffic control, um, in this area, in air traffic control, named Stephen Schrock, brings up this point that he, they actually dug into it, and they found out that the envelopes uh, on the stage aren't, weren't labeled back then. So you couldn't actually tell 
was it an envelope for best, best actor or actress? Or was it an envelope for best lighting? Or even best motion picture? They just weren't labeled. But also, a lot of times we say when we fix problems, oh, we need a redundant system. Well, there are two envelopes backstage for each category. And what had happened is the one was presented for, I think it was best actress. And then the envelope for best actress was sitting there. And it was handed to uh, Warren Beatty and, and the other presenter. Um, to read that, and, it, and there was confusion on his, on his face, and he was trying to figure it out because it said best actress, right? But then he just read what the movie was, and it didn't match the same as, as best movie. Chirac has a really great quote here. He says, um, uh, the information and situation may be vague, conflicting, or unexpected. It can seem hard for us to give voice to our uncertainty in this way, especially under pressure. When someone has a command position, in an operating theater, cockpit, or at the Oscars, it can be difficult for that person to indicate that they are not sure what is going on. This is played out in several accidents and moreover in everyday life. But sometimes, and this is the key point here, the most powerful phrase may be something along the lines of, I do not understand what is going on. And so when somebody says that, that should be a perk to you, especially if you're a leader, to be more deliberate and slow down. And also you should encourage that in, in, in yourself and others. Anyone, anyone use S3? Anyone remember that outage, that little teeny outage they had? This is that outage that cost millions of dollars in US East One, and this is hundreds of millions of dollars, and this was, I think, a couple years ago now. Um, this is the post mortem from it that Amazon published, and I, I had an observation about it that you won't read the words human error in that retro once. It's, it's just not there. But what, you, what, what, is, uh, what happened is a, an engineer was doing a normal operational activity, uh, wrote in the tool, typed a command, and he was pulling some servers out of rotation. And instead of three, he typed like 30. So it pulled all the servers out of rotation, uh, which is a problem. Um, so costs hundreds of millions of dollars. Did anyone think, uh, I bet that guy got fired? A guy or gal got fired? Yeah. But what's interesting here is that that's not the tack that Amazon, Amazon took. Um, they use it as a learning opportunity. So they found throughout the rest of their Amazon infrastructure that there were other tools that didn't do any input sanity checking on those numbers, right? They didn't say, you know, hey, are you really sure you want to, you know, S bin shut down S3 when you run this, right? And so they retrofitted the rest of their tools with operational checks that don't, you can override them. But if they don't make sense in the common use case, they'll pause and ask the operator, is this really what you want to do? Um, the service health dashboards, real dependencies, they learned that. It turns out that the service health dashboard is run on S3, which means if S3 is down, you, can't, you don't have a service health dashboard. So they had to fix that as, in real time as S3 was down. They posted it somewhere else. Index subsystem insufficient partitioning. So what this meant is the indexing system was taken down. And um, there's an algorithm that balances the, in, the partitions across, across all the servers, right? Um, and, what there's, and that algorithm works in all the other data centers. And they found out that in US East 1, that algorithm actually wasn't tuned correctly. And so it was causing performance problems that were only observable in this sort of situation. And do you know why the algorithms didn't work? It's because most everybody uses US East 1. So the data that they had for all of their other av availability zones doesn't match the usage pattern in US East 1. And by the way, do you know why everybody uses US East 1? It's the first option on the list. Nobody changes the dropdown. <laughs> now, what's interesting, if you've used Amazon's control panel recently, they actually have changed that. There's a little JavaScript that will suggest a different region, I think, based on your IP, something that's closer to you. Right? And so, but who would have thought designing, some web page designer designing that years ago probably, that not changing that default is going to cause an S3 outage and cost millions of dollars. The other thing, the indexing subsystem had not been fully restarted for years. It had been, I mean, parts of it had been restarted, but the service itself had, was so stable it had been running for like five years, I think. And when it, this was a, uh, an example of, okay, we're going to take everything out and effectively reboot it. So the point here is, had Amazon just fired this engineer, they would have never learned any of these critical details, not only about their system, but about how their teams and their people respond to serious incidents like this. All right. So, better choice for human error, stop saying it, then keep not saying it.
Dirty word number four. Why don't you? You should have. These are called counterfactuals. And they come up a lot of times in retros. Somebody will ask them, well, why didn't, why didn't you notice that gauge? You know, why, didn't, why didn't you do something about that? So counterfactual thinking is a concept in psychology that involves the human tendency to create possible alternatives to events that have already occurred. Um, and of course, counterfactual comes from uh, counter to the facts, sort of this what if thinking. Um, the problem is it talks about a reality that doesn't exist. You know, I just kind of pull the, the back to the future thing because it's like, um, we're, we spend so much time talking about a thing that I already didn't do, so I don't know why I already didn't do it, right? <laughs> Um, so, and the nice thing about counterfactuals, they're really easy to spot in retros because there's a lot of this what if, why didn't you, and it's like, well, yeah, I already did not do that thing. So, again, uh, I love this picture. Um, discuss any real reality that does not exist. So, counterfactuals, don't do that. And if you lead retros or sit in on retros, um, try to steer the conversation um, if you hear people doing counterfactual reasoning. Oh, this is my favorite dirty word. Best <laughs> practice. So this is literally me every time I hear that word. <sighs> Best practice is a method or a technique that has been generally accepted as superior, superior to any alternatives because it produces results that are also superior, only the best of best practices, gluten-free and they become a standard way of doing things. So who here likes their best practices? Who here likes other people's best practices? Ah, see, honest answer, someone's hand went up and then other, eh, right? No, that's, that's exactly the point, right? So here's the problem with that, best is superlative. It means that there's only one way to do it, right? And it's interesting, um, if you talk to, I do this all the time uh, with team, like a database team, and you'll say, oh, we have a best practice for rebooting the database. Okay, cool. And uh, so you'll, you'll take the engineers apart and say, walk me through that best practice, and it's, it's subtly different in fun little ways, right? So clearly you don't have a best practice, because if you did, your engineers would give you the same answer, right? Um, the other problem is, uh, in complex systems, it often ignores the context Right? How many people of you, or how many of you have, have been in situations where um, somebody says, well, it's a best practice because Netflix does it. And you're like, we're running a website to sell cable subscriptions or whatever it might be. Like, we're not Netflix, right? Best practices are often not completely defined also, especially in complex systems. So it's funny how many people have this, where it's like, okay, the best practices run the runbook, and in the runbook it says do this, and then do this, and then do this, and then go ask Bob. That's the best practice. And then you go and ask Bob, and this of course is in an incident context. You ask Bob, and they're like, oh, I don't know, that's Carol's domain now, go ask her, right? And that's the best practice. It becomes this talking to people, which is fine, but that's the thing, is that that's why best practice doesn't really doesn't really apply here. These next couple of points um, are really actually detrimental when you use it. So best practice, because it's superlative, leaves no space for any innovation or discovery at all. It, it shuts conversations with team members down. And I've seen this happen where, where Two engineers are talking through and they're having a really rich contextual conversation about a particular topic. And someone comes up and says, oh, we're just gonna do it this way because that's the best practice. It's like, did you, did you just tell me to go screw myself? Like, what, what's going on here, right? So you can see that a lot of time where that's used to shut down conversations. I love this quote, uh, this was at a conference a few years ago. This is industry best practice, management loves that. Of course, we're not doing a weird off, yeah, like Amazon and Netflix did. And they're doing pretty good. But if you look at Amazon, Netflix, Google, Spotify, right, and we talk about their best practices, it's not like they were handed them. They figured this stuff out on their own, right? The real problem here is that uh, best practice applies uh, to a domain little of our work actually exists in. So um, those of you that have seen me um, speak before, you know I was going to do a Kinevin. People familiar with Kinevin a little bit? Uh, this is a sense-making model um, by a, a Welsh uh, scientist researcher who worked at IBM. 
Um, and uh, this is about uh, maybe 10 years old now, maybe a little older, 15 years. Um, but the point is, is that it puts our, the, the domains that we're in, and most of the time we're kind of in disorder. That means, that means we don't know which one we're in. It doesn't really mean disorder. It means we don't know which one we're in. And so there are obvious systems. There's complicated systems. There are complex systems. And there's chaotic systems. And of course, the way, the practices that you would use, that's the point here. It's like it's, it's trying to help you figure out which system you're in so you can figure out which practice to use, right? And so you'll notice, though, Best practice is only applicable to obvious or simple systems. Um, there's a great quote. This is Dave Snowden, the guy who, who came up with this. Um, let's see what he has to say about best practice. A distinction between good and best practice is actually quite important. Um, in a complicated domain, there are several different ways of doing things, all of which legitimate if you have the right expertise. And trying to force people to adopt one of them is actually quite dangerous. It will basically piss people off, to be honest, to the point where they won't apply best practice where it should be applied. So here's the point. We work up in the complex and the complicated, and that is not where you apply best practice. That's not a world that we live in. So if you, would, if you, wanna, if you wanna use that, fine, uh, you, but use good practice, um, or make sure that you're actually talking about a, a, a real obvious or simple system. So, what kind of continuous improvement would you say you do here? Uh, some takeaways from all of this talk about language and dirty words and, and things we should not be saying because they constrain our ability to do our best work. And they constrain our colleagues' abilities to do their best work. So the path of continuous improvement is not linear and of course it's not one and done. Right, we don't, this is, I always love, it's like we're doing, we're doing DevOps, which is a continuous improvement effort, and we're gonna be done in two years. It's like, well, <laughs> no, that's, that's not how that works, right? Uh, so it's, it's not linear, there's lots of ways to get there, and in fact, I guarantee you in the large enterprises and systems that you're working in, people that are doing a DevOps transformation are getting to it through different paths, and that's okay. Um, but of course, there are also stories of people that thought the transformation was done, and then they stop, and then they slide back, right? So it is continuous, continuous improvement. Takeaway number two, respect reality. So we work in complicated, mostly complex, but sometimes complicated systems, and we need to respect that reality. So counterfactuals, not a thing. Root cause, not a thing. Finally, and uh, probably the most important, we need to treat people like the professionals that they are. Uh, yeah. Dr. Decker has this great, great quote that says, people don't go to work to do a bad job. And in fact, uh, one of the things he says about human error is, um, if it made sense to someone in the moment to do that and you fired them, I guarantee you it's gonna make sense to someone else on their team to do that thing. So you haven't really solved the problem by firing that person. So you need to treat them like the professionals that they are. All right, go forth and continuously improve. I have one more thing though. One more thing, I have one minute too. And I've done this as a lightning talk. If you came for continuous integration dirty words, here they are, I got five of them, broken builds. So I go in all the time and I see uh, like builds on the build radar and they're red and I'm like, but, but you're doing continuous integration and just fix the build. And I'm like, ah, that build's always red. Broken build is a dirty word. <laughs> flappers, testing, right? So these are tests that will go red and then green and then sometimes orange. And so I actually worked with a team and they added a feature to their CI system where orange meant the test sort of sometimes passes or not. They literally <laughs> added a color, which uh, I was like, okay, either remove the test or fix the test. Uh, Bob's Mac Mini .local. So I worked with... <laughs> I worked with so many organizations where they have this great like Windows Linux infrastructure and that's where they do all their builds and it's all, it's all chefed and everything. And then they have a mobile build and you find out like literally all the iOS builds are coming from Bob's Mac Mini that's sitting on Bob's desk and it's in the CI system. You're like, huh, that's cool. Until you knock the little Mac Mini on the floor, then it's not as cool. Uh, merge window, so if you work in a, an environment where you have these big windows where you merge the code and nobody can do anything while that's happening, 
You're not doing trunk-based development. You're not doing small batch sizes. So merge windows, if you do them, bad word. And the last one, Jenkins build number. And this is the idea that you are encoding information out of Jenkins or out of some tools that into your build artifacts. That's a bad, uh, um, that's a bad pattern because I can't tell you how many times I've seen people switch, switch from Jenkins to GitLab or Travis to CircleCI and all of that metadata, gone. So that's a dirty word. All right, cool, I think it's break time.